So we are in London and we're in the esteemed company of Kenny Wayne Shepherd. How are you Kenny? I'm good, thanks. So, welcome to, to England's London again. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a few gigs coming up um, in, in England and then you're playing the Rambling Man Fair uh, at the weekend. Right. And a couple of years after you played it originally, so you're looking forward to that? Yeah, actually I, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, when we played there, I think it was two years ago, uh, that was our first appearance at the Randland Man Festival, and I thought we had a great performance. Uh, there was a big crowd, and I, I felt like I felt really good about the performance. Um, and I guess they felt really good about it too because they asked us to come back. So I'm really excited to be back. Obviously, we love playing in England and the UK, and uh, you know, every time we come back, we see more and more people showing up. So you know, we're expanding the fan base, and we're reaching more people. And uh, it's just all very exciting. But the Ramblin' Man Fair is a very, it's a top shelf, high quality festival. It's a great production, the way they have everything laid out. Uh, the bands are great. Uh, the whole event is run very smoothly. So it's, it's always good to be a part of those kind of festivals. And the timing's pretty good, because last time around you had, uh, was it Laid, Laid On Down, that's the album mm -hmm. that was out. And then the new album, The Traveler, mm -hmm. uh, came out, I think about a month ago. On yeah on Pro Vogue uh, on the Mascot label group. That's right. So tell us a little bit about the the progression between the two albums. They're, they're pretty similar in terms of the band that's playing on them, uh, but how's the style evolved? How would you describe that? Well, uh, yeah, it's basically the entire, uh, all the elements, the people involved, are the same from Lay It On Down to The Traveler. Um, musically, I think The Traveler is a little more, it rocks a little harder. Um, and maybe when you listen to the whole album from start to finish, you might not get that sense, but if I start going down track by track and listing the ones that I think rock, you know, like Woman Like You, the title track, Long Time Running, uh, the second song, uh, Mr. Soul, the Buffalo Springfield song, uh, Turn to Stone, the Joe Walsh song, all those songs rock. And then you got even like the song I Want You, which is real contemporary blues, but it's got so much fiery guitar in it, and it kind of rocks all on its own well, uh, as well. So it's kind of, it leans a little more in the rock direction, but it certainly has all that, you know, the blues element running through the entire vein of the record. Yeah, so I've been listening to it over, over the last uh, week or so, and certainly uh, what you're saying about it rocking hard, it certainly does. And the, the guitar, if anything, is more to the fore. You, you brought out the example of I Want You. Mm -hmm. It's got, it's got the, some really sort of heavy, heavy, kind of unique drums on there. Mm -hmm. But then just when you think it's kind of just going to peter out, then you kind of you kick in with extended um, solo, mm -hmm. which is great. Yeah. Kind of unexpected as well. Yeah, but, you know, to me, that's if you were to ask me, well, Kenny, what's your, what does modern blues sound like to you? That would be. For me and my music, that'd be the song that I'd play for you. Now, you know, that's making a, a di differentiation between blues and blues rock, you know. So this is like contemporary blues and there's blues rock, but that to me it has all the elements. It has this really deep, deep groove that's, you know, almost on the back side of the beat. You got the horns and they're playing in the verses, they're playing like a real contemporary sounding part. It's real young and kind of fresh sounding, but then in the when it goes to the guitar solo, they go to a straight up traditional Albert King almost kind of part. So it's got elements of new and old, but it's all blues and it's really cool. And it does have, uh, you mentioned the horns, it does have quite a live feel to it, both in the horns and then uh, you've got the, uh, the, the organ, the uh, you know, keys mm -hmm. bubbling under, and it, and it kind of cuts through quite a lot. Yeah. Was it played live in the studio? How did you record it? Yeah, the only thing we really added after the fact was the horns. The horns weren't there when we tracked the record, but every album that I do, we set up all in the in the room together and play together as a band and we try and do the least amount of overdubs possible because the the real essence of what we do best is the live performance so to best represent my band we have to capture that in the studio one thing that i, I noticed and going back in some of your previous records um noah's been your, your co-lead frontman for for a long time 20 years or so but usually when, when you both sing on the record, you can kind of tell who's who. Mm -hmm. On this one, I was having a hard time, and it's a good thing, of differentiating the two of you. The voices really match well, mm -hmm. and you, your voices really acquired some, some girth and some depth to it. Do you, do you feel that your voice has developed? Yeah, well, yes, it's, uh, it's definitely developed. It's, it's evolved. I've kind of started to become more comfortable and also 
being able to kind of explore the limits and the and and how far I can actually take my instrument when it comes to singing. So there's a natural evolution that's taking place with my singing just from doing it, you know, and you know, singing every night on stage and doing it in the studio. So yeah, I, I think I'm becoming a better singer. I still consider myself a guitar player that happens to sing. Uh, and I think Noah is an incredible lead singer and it's really easy to just let him sing all the songs because he sounds so great but at the same time I think that with me singing uh, at least some of the songs it lends an even more personal element to my music. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm right, your, your, your origin is, is Louisiana, whereas he's more Midwest? Well, he's Ohio, so he's around the Mason-Dixon line, which, you know, is the, is the divider between the North and the South, so I think technically he qualifies as Southern, but, you know, just <laughs> ever so slightly. Yeah, yeah because what I liked on, um, I mean, the, particularly the, the, the track Tailwind, which I believe inspired the, the album title, uh, that has a that has a real country edge to it, mm -hmm. but again, to your point, it's a, it's a contemporary type of country. Right. Well, the interesting thing about it is, is that I've always written songs, even going back to my first album. The people that I write songs with tend to come from Nashville. Um, you know, so there's going to be some elements of that because those people are writing country music most of the time. Um, but they're dying to do other stuff as well, so it's always great when when I can get together with them because we do blues and rock and stuff. But but there and and I grew up listening to country music also. But what's interesting is people, especially the, with the last two albums, want to make a, a point of mentioning that there's these elements <clears throat> of country music in the songs. But really, it's there. But but country, you have to understand how much how much country music has kind of come in my direction. It's like country music has come more towards rock than, than we have gone towards country, you know? And so I love country music and I love, you know, all different kinds of music and all those genres that I grew up listening to, R&B, country, soul music. You can hear soul music on Better With Time. I mean, there's that soul influence on that. All that stuff that I grew up listening to as a kid is going to find its way into my music. But I'm not so convinced uh, that, you know, it's m it just comes across as people think I'm going in a country direction where I actually feel like country's coming more into a, a rock direction. Yeah, and sometimes you do a festival and you'll play on the, what they call the blues stage or you play on the, the outlaw country stage mm -hmm. and, and you go, well, hang on, I'm not a little bit country, but I'm more rock and roll. Right. Um, and then, yeah. In America, it would be all of those kinds of music fall under American roots category. So country, blues, rock, um, R&B, all of that is really American roots music. So I get it, it's okay. And really the Outlaw Country stage at the Ramblin' Man is the same stage as the blues stage. They just changed the name on no, the different days. days yeah. <laughs> so it's, it, it's the same thing. So um, it doesn't really bother me. And you know what, we've done some things with country artists. I mean, I've done uh, Winona Judd recorded a song that I wrote back in the 90s and I played on her record for that. I played on one of Willie Nelson's records. Uh, I just recently uh, did a show with a big country artist back in the States in Oklahoma and uh, you know I, I don't mind doing that because I feel like you know all these kind of genres are connected in one way or another anyways. So what, what I found fascinating and I'd love to hear about it is you played the Montreux Jazz Festival. Yeah. So you've got jazz? I assume well, not. <laughs> well, what's also interesting is all these blues fests and jazz fests that you hear about all over the world um, are not exclusively exactly. blues or jazz anyways. Yeah. And uh, we did Montreux back in the 90s, and it was really cool. Um, Carlos Santana came up and played with us, and you know this was our first time back there since the 1990s, so we had a tremendous show. It was completely sold out. Uh, it was a really electrified performance. We all really enjoyed ourselves and had a great time and the crowd reacted uh, amazingly. So that was a lot of fun, but uh, we also recently did one called the North Sea Jazz Fest and that one actually had a ton of jazz music on the lineup on various stages. I was actually so impressed at the amount of different styles of jazz that they had represented at that festival. So. You know, and Montreux had the same. So it is good because, you know, those guys 
need an audience and an outlet for their music as well. But, you know, they bring in guys like Kenny Wayne Shepherd and ZZ Top and, you know, at, at North Sea they had Toto. You know, yeah. we're not talking about jazz bands here exclusively, but I'm, it's, it's good to be a part of those festivals. Yeah, and you have players like Robin Ford who, who kind of straddled the two, you know, and he's, he's revered in both communities. And it, it, there's a certain genrefication right. that goes on, which, which I know it, it, it's great because it attracts new audiences, but uh, so long as people's minds are left open. And I have an example of that. Your song, uh, Boom Black, was uh, recorded by Five Finger Death Punch, mm -hmm. I believe. What was the background to them? taking that song well they wanted to do it and I'm glad they did I mean you know we have a situation now where this song I wrote this song uh, with some people that I've been writing with my entire career since I was a teenager we wrote this song I recorded it on my second album and it was a number one hit song for us in the in the States it did had tremendous success all over the world and now just a little over 20 years later it's number one again with another band doing it and to me that's a testament to the song and because i always thought it was a great song but it's easy to kind of be biased because it you know i wrote, helped write the song so um maybe i'm a little prejudiced but i've always believed that that song is a great song it's a timeless song and it and it and it crosses genres like i believe anybody of any background could record that song and and potentially have a hit with it so they did it, and I'm glad they did. And then they wanted to do another version of it uh, with me playing on it. And so then they got me and Brantley Gilbert and Brian May from Queen. So it was really cool because we have a metal band, classic rock guy from uh, Queen, um, blues rock guy with myself and Brantley Gilbert, who's a country artist, and yeah. all these different genres coming together on this amazing song. And, and we're doing great things with it. You know? So your professional journey, I mean, it's now pretty much 25 years since um, um, your, your earlier album came out. And I guess you could always trace back to when your dad, who I think was a, a DJ, mm -hmm. and you, you went to, I think you went to some classic artists when you were really, really young. Mm -hmm. can, can, what can you remember about some of those early gigs? Well, my first concert that he says he took me to was Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker. Really? And I was <laughs> three years old. So I think that probably was the uh, beginning of my uh, love for blues music, you know. And, I mean, I went and saw everybody that came through town. I mean, I remember going to see Conway Twitty and uh, Hank Williams Jr. and ZZ Top and Aerosmith and uh, Van Halen and even guys like in the hair band days, we'd go see, you know, the hair bands like <laughs> Poison and White Lion and Great White and uh, Warrant and all, you know, whoever it was, we just loved going to see live music, you know. Um, obviously, when I saw Stevie Ray Vaughan in Double Trouble when I was seven years old, was a life-changing experience for me because he just truly inspired me. He lit this fire in me to want to play guitar with that passion and that emotion that he played with. Um, but seeing all these different bands, with, I was absorbing all of that uh, as a young child. And I didn't know it at the time, and I don't think anybody knew it at the time, but all of that and going and seeing that and experiencing those shows and and soaking that up was going to help uh, you know help me become the artist that I am today. Because I think early on when when we first heard you uh, and people sort of try to sort of think well who's who's this guy he's got kind of a um, three names and people sort of immediately say oh he's the new Stevie Ray Vaughan. Right well the interesting thing about that it's a story that's not often told but I didn't I wasn't originally going to use the three names I was just I've always just been Kenny Wayne my whole life right and uh, and that's what I was originally it was the Kenny Wayne band right Kenny Wayne just Kenny Wayne or the Kenny Wayne band or whatever but um, then this guy there was this guy in Texas uh, guys kind of, well anyways, uh, there's some guy named Kenny Wayne in Texas <laughs> and, uh, and he put up a big, uh, a, a big stink about the idea that I was using the name Kenny Wayne, that he was the original Kenny Wayne, that I'm trying to rip off his name and reputation. He's sending all these harassing letters to my dad and threatening and all of this really? stuff. And, uh, so we asked our attorneys, we're like, so what's the deal with this, you know? And, uh, and they said, well, legally, 
he could possibly have a claim to the name Kenny Wayne because I guess he did bluesy rock music. He never really made a name for himself. But he said since he professionally performed under that name in the state of Texas, he might have a legitimate claim in Texas. So you could use Kenny Wayne everywhere else in the world, except you may he may be able to challenge you in Texas. In one of your major markets. <laughs> right. So so we just decided, you know, put this to rest. The guy said you can make a variation on it, you know, give yourself a nickname like Smoking Kenny Wayne, you know, whatever. I was never into those kind of bluesy nicknames. So we just added it's actually Shepherd is my mom's maiden name. And uh, and so we just added that, and that's how I became. That's why I became Kenny Wayne Shepherd. I never intended on doing that, especially not because of the the whole Stevie Ray Vaughan reference either. And I think you've said yourself, but also it, it's 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 clear from your style that it it's 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 much broader than let's say Stevie had a, a very particular style, mm -hmm. very aggressive style, but it's right. kind of narrow in, in right. kind of the, the, the influences and, and the type of music, whereas yours is quite broad. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, I think, Hendrix is your other right. main guitar influence. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, Jimmy was is one of my biggest influences, probably right there with Stevie Ray Vaughan. And, but others as well. You hear a lot of Albert King in my playing, which you heard a lot of that in SRB's playing as well, but B.B. King, all those guys. But um, yeah, for me, I think that when you listen to my music, I do a lot of songs that I don't think SRV ever would have even considered writing or recording. Um, but that's the difference in, you know, him as a human being and, and me as a human being and my upbringing and my background, because I, I grew up around a radio station with my dad. And so, and I heard all these different kinds of music. And so all of that kind of stuff finds its way into my, into my, the music that I write and the stuff that I record. So like, Blue on Black never would have been a Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble song, um, you know. And I mean, there's many, many examples throughout my my entire discography of songs that I don't, you know. You can tell that we have kind of two different approaches to the music, but there's a lot of common threads too. Which, for me, the thing that I took away from him the most was that passion and that intensity that he played with, and that's what I try to accomplish when I pick up the instrument. So you mentioned your influences a lot. Do you feel responsibility as a modern blues act to kind of carry the torch for the new generation, given that, sadly, a lot of the old guys are, are either dead or dying, and Dr. John being the, one of those musicians, again, from Louisiana, that passed, sadly? Right. Well, I mean, there's this inevitability. Um, and I was just sitting with Joe Bonamassa recently, and we were just having this discussion about this inevitability that as long as we continue to live and play music, sooner or later, we're going to be the old guys of the blues, you know? And so we've all, you know, I've always been referred to as, you know, the child prodigy, the child virtuoso, the young guy, you know? Uh, and so it's interesting, this transition that's beginning to happen where it's like we're becoming the, some of the older guys in the blues. and so. I think with any of it, you know, comes a little bit of responsibility, but from the very first day that I put my band together, I made a commitment to myself and to the music because it, I loved it so much that however big or small my audience was going to be, and what, however big my footprint was going to wind up being in the music, I was going to do whatever I could to turn as many people on to blues music as possible because I loved it so much and uh, it was that important to me. And you've been pretty prolific, if you look at this of 2011 onwards, the, not only the collaborations you've done, working with the rides, um, the two albums you did with the rides, um, I understand that there may be some more music coming? Yeah, Barry and I have already written a few, like three or four songs. Um, Steven was busy last year, he was on tour in the States with Judy Collins, I was on tour with my band for the la my last record, Lay It On Down. So uh, the three of us always get together as a band and write <clears throat> for the record, so we just haven't found that opening yet. So I think the plan is at the end of this year, which we did on previous records, we started writing in like November, December, and we start recording in either December or January. So we're, uh, we're all in agreement that we want to do another record, and uh, so it's just a matter of 
finishing up the writing and getting in the studio and doing it. What was a nice surprise when I went to see Crosby, Stills and Nash? This is uh, probably 2013-2014. That they, they played songs they wrote together, but each of them played some of the solo stuff. And Stephen did um, uh, "Don't Want Lies" yeah, from no. the first ride, so yeah. I thought it was pretty cool. I thought that was really cool. You know, it's like, and I do some of the ride stuff in my show too. I was um, going to ask you maybe a rambling man whether any of that would surface. Yeah, we're going to do uh, "Talk to Me, Baby" is in the set, which was an Elmore James blues cover that we did on the first rides record oh it's a great album that yeah so but even in my show back in the states in june we were doing uh i got to use my imagination which was on the pierce arrow album um i mean i really love the the stuff that we've done with that band and i think steven does too and so i think that's why we've also individually chosen to incorporate that into stuff that we're doing outside of the rides so, uh, but I thought it was cool. I saw a YouTube video, I think, where they were playing at uh, Royal Albert Hall or something when they did that. And I saw Steven doing it, and I saw those guys playing yeah. a song. Like, that's my guitar riff, and that's like, you know, a song that I helped write with those guys and, and with, with Steven, and then I see CSN performing, it was pretty cool. I guess you, you've not played the Royal Albert Hall yourself. No, I haven't, actually, and uh, that's something that we're kind of working towards, so. Uh, hopefully that will be in the not too distant future. <laughs> yeah, that should be that should be uh, definitely a, a great idea. You talked about we talked about your your voice evolving from your guitar tone standpoint. You, I mean, you pretty much have nailed, a nailed on tone, and you've got your your classic sixty one guitar. And there's a, a great story about how you you saw the guitar. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like a like a childhood love, and then you thought you'd lost it, and then you found it again. Yeah. Well. When I first found the guitar, I couldn't afford to buy it. And, but it was that moment where, you know, I'd been searching for that one guitar and, uh, and that was it. I sat down and I picked it up and it was like, fit, fit me like a glove. And, uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't buy it. So I was really sad to have to walk away from it and leave it. And I thought I would never see it again. But the next time I came out to Los Angeles, I went straight back to the guitar center and there it was hanging on the wall and it was still there and I picked it up and I'm like, yes, this is it. And I sat and must have played it for about three hours and then finally my dad and everybody was like, we gotta go, we gotta, you gotta do something. This was in the, in the guitar center. <laughs> yeah, at the, in the vintage room there. And they were like, you gotta, you gotta go, uh, it's time to do sound check. And I said, I'm not leaving here without this guitar. And they were like, but I was like, you don't have, you can't afford that guitar. I was like, well, I'm not leaving here without it because I know if I leave here, it's definitely not gonna be here the next time. So. <laughs> They talked about it and they agreed to buy it and they split it up. My dad, my A&R guy, and my attorney split it three ways on their credit cards under the condition I'd pay them back for it. And I did and it's been mine ever since. And more recently, am I right, you, you've, uh, you've got a signature guitar, the Crossroads guitar. Uh, well, I have a bunch of, well, I have a signature model that, <clears throat> that Fender put out for many, many years that we recently retired and now we're designing a brand new signature Strat that's going to come out next year. That Crossroads guitar is a one-off custom shop guitar that we created between myself and Todd Krause, one of the master builders at the custom shop. We've been trying to uh, create unique guitars over the past several years that have their own identity to them and, and kind of a story behind them. And that's one of them. You know, that it has a fictional story behind the guitar that, like, you know, some guy went out on the crossroads to try and sell his soul to become a famous blues man, but it just didn't take. And it didn't work out for him. He picked up the guitar and he couldn't play worth the crap, so he tossed the guitar in a ditch and abandoned the whole idea and left the guitar there abandoned for, I don't know, 20 years or so, and it got all worn out and weathered, and, and then uh, somebody finds it. We, we come across it, pull it out of the ditch, and put it all back together and bring it back to life, and it looks kind of like a reject, you know? But the imprint of the Highway 49 and 61 is right there on the guitar, <laughs> and left its mark like a tattoo, and it's a cool guitar. So you, you played with, you've had the, the, the honor, uh, an opportunity to play with a lot of other, other guitar players uh, from all sorts of genres. Uh, you mentioned Billy Gibbs early, earlier on. Uh, are there any guitarists that you'd love to play with you'd never had the chance to? Well, this is one of those questions that I get in almost every interview. And it's one of those things where I'm always, and I get, I understand why everybody asks the question, but for me, that would mean that I, I sit around in my spare time with a notepad and a pen writing famous guitar players' names down and checking them off my list as I go. And I just don't do that. 
So I just kind of take it one day at a time. And every time I've ever toured with an artist or played with an artist on stage or done something special with them, it's all happened very organically. And it was never because I intended on doing that. So I just kind of wait and see what happens. Yeah, I mean, there is an aspect of, I suppose, the word serendipity, because you did the Experience Hendrix tour some years ago, mm -hmm. where you were kind of randomly thrown together with all these other people that you may not have ever met, but um, how, how was that when you, you, you realize you're on the, the bill with all the, these other sort of well-known names? Well, I've done that thing before it was even a tour. I've been, I was part of every single uh, <clears throat> Experience Hendrix concert that was ever done except for uh, this past year is the first time I didn't do it. Um, and it was cool because bringing together, again, you bring uh, people from different kind of musical backgrounds, um, but it just goes to show the widespread uh, effect that Jimi Hendrix and his music had on so many different guitar players, you know? And because you got people like Buddy Guy and Zach Wilde and Kenny Wayne Shepherd and Eric Johnson, Doyle Bram, I mean, just like, a lot of different guys from different backgrounds that all were influenced by Jimi Hendrix. Um, and with, with your influence for, from Jimi, um, whenever I've seen you, Booty Child is kind of one of one of the, the, the main tracks sort of, that you play towards the end or as an encore. Uh, are there any other Hendrix tracks that you've been kind of thinking about putting in the set, or is that kind of the, the one that I think best, best represents your playing? Well, ever since I put my band together at age 15, that's been the last song in the show every show so the audience a lot of people know that so they wait for that uh, but we did on one of my albums on uh, on the second album we did I don't live today and on the third album we did uh, them changes so we've done those songs in the show over the years and we also did a version of come on which was Earl King that's an Earl King song that Jimi Hendrix covered that then Stevie Ray Vaughan covered that we've done in the show as well too. And we've done uh, the Voodoo Child, well everybody debates, is it Voodoo Child? Is it Voodoo Chile? I mean whatever, but the slow bluesy version, we do that from time to time in the show as well too. So coming right up to present and in the very immediate term, you play Rambling Man at weekend, so there's a strong chance that people have a, the opportunity to hear you play that. Well, and you're, yeah, you're going to hear Voodoo Child for sure, <laughs> um, along with you know stuff from the new record, uh, a few songs from previous albums as well. But what you're going to hear a lot of is hopefully a lot of uh, enthusiastic guitar playing and uh, some musicians up there giving 150 percent. And. Um, are you encouraging people to bring their own harmonica and play along? <laughs> no. Uh, you know what's weird is I've had guys, the har it's, harmonica guys do that a lot, but one time I was doing a festival and uh, a guy showed up with a trumpet in the Kidding. audience. And, and I was playing and I started hearing this trumpet and I thought, oh, that's, that must be a band on another stage. And I'm hearing, you know, the wind is blowing the sound in our direction. Until I finally looked out and I saw this guy in the audience playing trumpet. And, you know, I appreciate the enthusiasm, but usually it's a bit presumptuous to just bring your own instrument and start playing along with the band when you haven't been invited to do so. Okay, so shout out to anyone come to Rambling Man. This is not a jam session. This is Katie Wayne Shepherd and the Kenny Wayne Shepherd Band, well, the they're headlining the Outlaw Country stage to play their set, their songs, and you're there to listen. Well, if you're, if, you're, if you're there to jam, then you'll be asked to be on stage. The jamming takes place on stage. Yeah. The jamming doesn't happen out there. <laughs> and to remind everyone, the, the great album, The Traveler, is already out on uh, Provoke, uh, the Master Label Group label. It's uh, a great, great album, great progression for everything you've done before. Thank you. And we really love it. So. Looking forward to seeing you at the fair and enjoy the rest of the dates. Thanks. And I believe you're coming back in November if I've got yes, for the show. Yeah, we have several shows, I think, in the, uh, in the UK, uh, in England, um, in November. I don't have them off the top of my head, but I think it's about five different shows in November, one of which is at uh, Shepherd's Bush Empire here in London. That's great. It's my local venue, so great. even better. Perfect.
Kenny Wayne, Kenny Wayne Shepherd. It's been a pleasure talking to you, my friend. Thank you. And we'll see you there. All right. All the best.